Okay, I see quite a few people are still joining. So we'll just wait a minute or so before we get started. Okay, it looks like the number of participants joining this webinar is starting to level off. So I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for this second webinar in our EPIC series on the use of NAMS in risk assessment. This series is being co-organized by the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, PETA Science Consortium International, the Institute for In Vitro Sciences, and the California Department of Pesticide Regulation. I'm Rachel Bruner, a biologist with the US EPA, and I'll be co-moderating today's webinar along with several others, including Gino Scarano, a senior advisor from the New Chemicals Division of the EPA Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics, Niladri Baumek, a toxicologist in the Human Health Assessment Branch of the California DPR, Amy Klippinger, president of the PETA Science Consortium uh, International, and Christy Sullivan, the vice president of education and outreach at IIVS. You can advance the slide to... Uh, so we have two speakers today who will be presenting on the development and application of NAMS workflows and tools. First, we'll hear from Dr. Alistair Middleton from Unilever, and then we'll hear from Dr. Tara Barton McLaren from Health Canada. Before I introduce our first speaker, I just would like to note that the slides and the recording from today's webinar will be posted online um, at the link on the, do we, should we go to the second slide? There we go. Um, okay, so the slides and the recording, they'll be posted online at the link shown here on the screen um, shortly after the webinar. You'll also find all future EPIC webinar materials will also be available at this link as the series continues. Um, we will do a Q&A session at the end of the second presentation. The webinar is scheduled for one and a half hours, but we may wrap up earlier, kind of depending on how long the questions go. Everyone is currently muted, except for me, and you can type any questions in the questions mod module within your Zoom toolbar, and you'll see that at the bottom of your screen. Um, and when you do so, please indicate if your question is directed to a specific st speaker. Um, and we just ask that you don't use the, the chat function just to make things easier and more straightforward. Um, we have also enabled closed captions. And you can turn this feature on or off according to your preferences, also using that toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, at this time, I would like to invite Gino Scarano to share some introductory comments from EPA. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this second uh, uh, EPIC webinar. I would once again like to thank the two of our co-organizers, PETA, 
the PETA International Science Foundation and IVS for handling all the logistics, the website, and the handling of all the materials. Um, and also including Dr. Baumrich, um, I want to thank ev everyone on the planning group for helping to plan these series and invite our wonderful speakers. And I know the introduction will be coming shortly, but uh, I'd like to welcome Drs. Middleton and uh, Bar Barton McLaren for what I know are going to be great presentations on how we're all how how we can all think about using NAMs uh, and incorporating them into our risk assessment. So and it's good to see you, Tara. I haven't seen you in a while, so. Um, let's get started. Thanks. Back to you, Rachel. Thank you, Gino. Uh, our colleague, our colleague from the California DPR, Naladri Balmek, would also like to share some comments now. Thank you, Rachel. Hello, everyone. Uh, once again, welcome to the second session of the EPIC webinar series. First, uh, my sincere thanks to all panelists for including California Department of Pesticide Regulation. Uh, to this EPIC webinar series on a very important topic on new, appro new approach methodologies. We are excited to be involved along with US EPA, IIBS, and PETA. And I look forward to, to great presentations from wonderful speakers. Uh, best wishes to them. And I now return it back to Rachel. Thank you, Naladri. Uh, so speaking first today, we'll go ahead and get started, is Dr. Alistair Middleton. Uh, Dr. Middleton joined the Unilever Safety and Environmental Assurance Center, or SEAC, in 2014. After working in academia as a research associate in Germany and in the UK, uh, where he used mathematical mod models to understand the dynamics of complex biological systems, including hormone transport and gene networks. He is now a science leader in computational toxicology, where he leads a multidisciplinary team looking how, at how we can use computational models and in vitro data to make robust safety decisions without the use of animal testing. He has a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from the University of Edinburgh and a PhD in Applied Mathematics from the University of Nottingham. Uh, welcome, Alistair, and please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Rachel. Um, yeah, so I'd just like to begin by thanking uh, the organisers for giving us this opportunity to present some of the work we've been doing on developing and evaluating a systemic safety toolbox for the use in next generation risk assessment. Um, so um, hopefully the slides are moving forward. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, in NGRA is essentially an exposure led and hypothesis driven approach that where you're looking to understand how you can integrate new approach methodologies um, within a, tier, a decision framework so you can conduct your safety assessments without the use of animal data. And a key hypothesis underpinning this sort of work is that um, if there's no um, bioactivity at the consumer relevant concentrations, then there can be no adverse health effects. There's been a number of different um, decision frameworks that have been published in this space, notably the SURAT-1 framework and also the EPA toxicology blueprint uh, published by Rusty Thompson and his group. Um, but these generally, um, these different frameworks form a, a similar structure in that um, they are have a tiered um, format. Uh, so beginning at tier zero, uh, you're doing um, problem formulation, so collecting the available evidence you have on your chemical and your exposure scenario, taking into consideration, for example, um, information you get might get from various hazards and alerts. Um, and then uh, in many cases, you can already make a decision at this point, um, but then uh, in some cases, you may want to go to a further level of refinement. So in this case, we have tier one, which is where you would try and estimate a bioactivity exposure ratio. Um, so that is essentially where you're taking the information about the use case and exposure scenarios that I just spoke about um, and running, for example, uh, PBK models um, to estimate internal exposure levels and then coupling that with um, data from in vitro cell assays that are intended to cover off a broad range of biological effects that the chemical might be 
uh, causing um, that may be of toxicological concern. Um, so the essential, the essential idea there is that you're then modeling that data to estimate points of departure. Um, and so a key um, metric for, from the, for the decision point of view is this, as I say, bioactivity exposure ratio, um, which essentially gives you a measure of how far the exposure is from points of departure. So if your if your exposure levels are very far below the the PODs that you get, um, then in many cases you can already conclude that that is low risk based on that tier one assessment. But of course, taking into account whatever information you got from your um, problem formulation as well. Um, however, in other cases, you might find that the exposure levels are close to the points of departure, um, so you've got a small bioactivity exposure ratio in which case we would consider this to be uncertain risk. So you may be triggering some bioactivity, and then you can go to a further tier in refinement um, where you would maybe look to refine either your internal exposure estimates by, for example, generating maybe clinical data or refining them further in terms of understanding, but getting a better understanding of the biological effects that are um, being triggered by the, the cell in the different assays, uh, by the chemical in the different assays. So, um, we published a, um, a sort of case study looking at this uh, for a particular uh, example uh, where we considered Coumarin um, used as an ingredient of um, various consumer products. Um, this was published in 2020 in Bauser et al. in uh, Toxicological Sciences. Um, so I don't have time to go into that, but essentially it was um, gave us confidence that we could indeed use these nouns within that sort of tiered risk assessment framework um, to make a protective safety decision um, and understand how we can bring those different elements together. However, we, what we wanted to really do is then move beyond that and try and think about what would be a core um, suite of tools for that tier one um, component of the overall uh, risk assessment framework. So for estimating that initial BR um, that you get that I was speaking about. So that would be essentially understanding what the range of different in vitro cell assays and exposure models you should be using to estimate that BER, but also trying to understand, okay, once you get a number out from those um, from those data, at what point can you say confidently that something is low risk or maybe whether a given exposure level is actually uncertain risk and you need to do further refinement. So essentially, what is that decision point? Uh, the third point here, I'd just like to emphasize, of course, that, that, that although we're focusing on that specific core set of tools, in practice, we would always be doing this within an overall um, tiered assessment framework. So we would always, always have information, for example, that we would gather during the problem formulation and take into consideration uh, output from in silico tools and other um, pieces of information that would be used within the weight of evidence. Um, so the core, core NAMs under consideration are, of course, the PBK models, um, in vitro pharmacological profiling, high throughput transcriptomics, and a cellular stress panel. And the idea here is that we're trying to select assays that can cover both non-specific and non-specific mechanisms of toxicity. And in particular, what we're trying to do is have assays that can detect the very early perturbations that may occur that may be triggered by a chemical that could potentially lead to toxicity, but before the onset of any adversity. So in, by doing this, the idea is that you're being potentially protective of um, toxicological effects that may occur over, for example, chronic exposures, um, because you're just trying to ca capture those very early stages of that. Um, so once we determine what were the suite of tools that we wanted uh, for the toolbox, uh, we also had to think about what was the approach we wanted to do for really assessing it in terms of um, its, whether or not it's fit for purpose. Um, so in, in the context of what we're talking about here, it's really, can you actually use that toolbox confidently to make safety decisions that are protective of human health? So as opposed to, for example, using it to, for example, predict some adverse toxicity. Um, so it's really about making protective safety decisions. And with related to that, of course, is that question of do actually that set of assays that I just described, is that actually sufficient for providing that biological coverage that would be required? 
And for example, those PBK models that we use, are they actually sufficiently accurate in terms of their predictions of um, quantities such as the CMAX? And then when evaluating the toolbox, um, we don't want to just take into account, for example, animal uh, data that is often used to um, uh, evaluate different NAMs. We also want to take into consideration, for example, what is the available human safety data, because of course that's more relevant in many cases for what we're trying to be protective of. Uh, we also want to explicitly uh, take into consideration both chronic and ex acute exposure scenarios, because of course that's uh, what we want to be again protective of. And also um, this, the, this, the toolbox is a systemic safety toolbox. So we want to cover off a broad range of systemic toxicities and not necessarily just focus in on one specific endpoint. And then finally, um, as I mentioned before, we want to understand a, what's the sort of decision threshold we should be using for saying something is low risk. So that could be a threshold value on this BER, for example. Um, and so we wanted to try and uh, conduct a study that allow us to explore that. Um, so to do that, we um, took a benchmarking based approach. So the idea is, is that you have a series of chemicals and exposure scenarios where you are establishing a ground truth over um, whether that expo chemical exposure scenario is low risk or high risk. So that ground truth is coming from existing um, kind of risk assessment decisions that have been based on traditional methods. So that those would be composed of chemicals, for example, they're used in consumer goods or um, such as foods or cosmetics that are already considered to be safe. Equally, um, consumer goods uh, for the high risk, which would be, um, or not consumer goods, sorry, but substances that are used at relevant fit exposures that may be causing um, maybe some form of adversity or side effects that typically are, for example, drugs uh, that where we want to be protective against the effects that they may be causing from a consumer goods perspective. And so the idea is you run through these, um, uh, the that generate the data, treating those chemical exposure scenarios as though they were part of an ab initio risk assessment. So pretend you didn't know anything about them. Uh, generating the data through the PBK models and the in vitro cell assays, and then calculating the bioactivity exposure ratios, and then seeing essentially what you ended up with. Um, and in particular, if the toolbox was working well, what you would expect to see is that a, real, a nice distinction between the low risk and the high risk um, exposure categories, um, depending on this bioactivity exposure ratio. So you would hope to see that at some sort of maybe threshold value of the BER, you could start saying, OK, this is where we're seeing the low risk. And we can start saying something is low risk based on that BER threshold. So we divided um, our sort of um, approach into two steps. So we had initially a pilot study um, where essentially we locked down what the workflow and the toolbox actually were, um, how we would be using them together, um, and also this process for how we would evaluate it. In particular, we defined what the metrics were for measuring the performance of the toolbox, which I'll get into later. Um, and then we ran through it for a small set of chemicals. I'll, um, I'll describe that uh, in the next few slides. And also we developed a prototype decision model um, that we would then test further with an extension to that evaluation. Um, so I'll just go through what we got with the pilot study initially. Um, so again, we um, described, uh, so we took 10 chemicals, um, as I said already, we assigned different use case uh, scenarios to them and risk classifications for each of those. So many of the chemicals have multiple risk, um, sorry, uh, uh, exposure scenarios associated with them. Caffeine, for example, has three of these, um, one of which is high risk and one of which, and two of which are low risk. Um, so for example, with caffeine, you can of course have it in coffee quite safely, but then in some instances, people were exposed to very high levels and there were fatalities involved. Um, so the sort of thing that, of course, we want to be protective of. And then we define, of course, this uh, workflow. Um, so the only thing really to add here beyond what I've already said is that to estimate the bioactivity exposure ratio, we took um, the plasma C max that we get from the PBK models. 
um, and then compare that to the um, the minimum point of departure across the different cell assays that we were using. So the reason for doing that would be that it would represent probably the most conservative estimate of bioactivity and um, with the hope that it leads to uh, protective safety decisions. So the points of departure estimation, um, as I say, we had um, a sort of POD for each uh, technology. Um, so we we estimated points of departure for the IP for the in vitro pharmacological profiling the cell stress panel. Um, for high throughput transcriptomics, we were testing three different cell lines: so MCF7, HEPG2, and HEPRG. And actually, we then also used two different methods to estimate points of departure from that data. So we used one method, which is um, was developed in house called Bifrost, which essentially pulls out. Um, single cell uh, gene level, sorry, single gene level uh, points of departure. Um, and we also use BMD Express, which is very widely used in the field. Um, and for that, we were generating the pathway level points of departure. And I think Tara will talk a little bit more about these PODs that you get from high throughput transcriptomics in her talk. Um, but generally what we found was um, the gene level PODs that we got through Bifrost from the high throughput transcriptomics were the lowest and so the most conservative. If we were using the pathway level PODs, uh, we tended to find that those were much larger than everything else. So if, we've, if we use just those in the cell stress panel and the um, in vitro pharmacological profiling, then generally the lowest PUD would then instead come from the cell stress panel or the IPP. So in a nutshell, what was the most conservative point of departure to base a BER on really depend a lot on how you were analyzing that um, high throughput transcriptomics data. Um, so an important factor in terms of how we make decision making, uh, uh, decisions based on uh, these sorts of values that we get from uh, you know, the PBK models or the points of departure is really the uncertainty aspect. Um, so here depicted uh, is the point really that often what we get is um, point estimates from uh, different technologies. So you get maybe a single value representing your Cmax or a single value representing your points of departure. And that would typically be coming from your best estimate based on the available data. And so here, for example, you can see um, your Cmax is below the POD and therefore your BER is greater than one. Um, but of course, we know that those will have inherent uncertainties associated with them. So one way to handle this in the field is to think about what is the um, sort of um, safety factor you might associate with this. Uh, but another way to think about it is in terms of distribution. So um, you may, if you can quantify the uncertainty that is associated with those values, you can um, develop distributions um, which will show the range of plausible values for the Cmax and POD. So here, the height of the distribution represents the, the level of plausibility for that value. Um, so these are things that you can get from Bayesian statistical models, for example. Um, and so, for example, here, what you see is, is that while for most of those plausible values, the POD is above the Cmax, you can see there is a certain region here where maybe the Cmax is above the POD. And so if you think about things in probabilistic terms, the probability that the true BER based on these distributions is above one is, is not necessarily certain, right? This is just a cartoon, of course, but we wouldn't necessarily put it at 99% or something. Um, so it, it's just a way of trying to emphasize the point that if you understand these distributions, you can start characterizing that uncertainty and knowing when you need to do more refinement or when you can actually proceed with some degree of certainty about saying something, saying an exposure level is low risk. So this is an example of where you've got very low uh, uncertainty for both the Cmax and the POD estimates uh, with respect to each other. You've got a nice wide margin with respect to the bioactivity exposure ratio. In this case, the probability of the true BER being greater than one is probably close to one in this case. But again, it's just a count two. So. Anyway, so in terms of that initial pilot study, what we did was we um, at least characterized one of those distributions, so the C max uncertainty distribution. 
Um, so what we did was we took into consideration the fact that um, the PBK models are, can be parameterized in a number of different ways. You can parameterize them using in silico only uh, sources. Um, uh, so that's what we call level one PBK models. You've got in vitro parameters that you can um, use to further parameterize them, those models. So that's what we call level two. And then in some cases, you might be lucky enough to have some actual clinical data that you can use to further calibrate your models and refine the parameter estimates further. And so here what you see is as you work through those levels, what we've done is we've collected from the literature measured Cmax values for a range of chemicals and exposure scenarios and compared that uh, to the predicted values and, and plotted out essentially the, the error that you get, the relative error, according to the way that which the models were parameterized. And so, of course, as you might expect, as the models are the quality of the uh, parameterization has increased from in silico only parameterization through to using clinical data, the error essentially decreases. But furthermore, what I'd like to emphasize is that we were able to then use these data to develop a Bayesian statistical model of the underlying distribution. So that those distributions then quantifying the uncertainty and the PBK accuracy of the PBK model estimates. Um, and to cut a long story short, um, using those distributions, we were able to then establish um, thresholds on the BER values so that we could say, provided the BER was above a certain value, that the point estimate of the BER, that is, was above a certain value, then we could be confident uh, that it was low risk, that that exposure was low risk. So, for example, for PBK um, models that were modeled parameterized using only uh, in silico estimates, that's this level one, the BER threshold would have to be at least 110. Um, if the PBK level uh, level two models were used, so you have in vitro data, then it could be 11. And then for level three, where you have clinical data, then the threshold could be 2.5. And so just to illustrate this a bit further, uh, this is a sort of result that we got from that initial pilot study. So the blue shaded region represents the um, that uh, bioactivity exposure threshold. So essentially, because it's PBK level two, so that's again the in vitro parameterized models. Um, so anything above uh, approximately eleven uh, a BR of eleven is considered to be low risk in this decision model. And so we overlay there the benchmark, the results from the benchmark chemicals and exposure scenarios. Um, so the blue ones, again, the low risk ones, and then the yellow ones are the high risk ones. And so what we see quite clearly is that um, all, the, all the high risk ones that we identified are correctly identified as not low risk. So none of them are region of uh, falling in this blue area. So we're being 100% protective under that decision model and using the toolbox and associated workflow. Whereas um, in this case, about a third of the um, low risk ones are correctly being identified as low risk. And so we could already support those using that approach. If we um, were to go up to say the level three PBK estimates, so where you, you also have clinical data, then the utility would increase actually to almost 70% in that case. Um, so that would that study essentially locked in those uh, that workflow toolbox and decision model. And then we wanted to test it further with an additional um, set of chemicals. Um, initially, we went for roughly 40 chemicals and tried to get as many exposure scenarios as we could. A couple of chemicals dropped off the list for various reasons. So that's why it says 38 there now. Um, and one of the things that we really wanted to make sure we did well was the chemical selection with um, the extended evaluation. So um, one of the key points around that pilot study, beyond being a small set of chemicals, is also that those chemicals were manually selected. And that manual selection process can sometimes lead to biases in the way in, in what was actually being selected. Um, so people can tend to navigate towards the extremes that they worry about or or maybe the, the extremes that they think are extremely low risk. But we want to really cover off the broad range of potential um, chemical exposure scenarios that we need to be concerned about from a, um, a consumer goods perspective. And so 
to, to do the chemical selection, we used a randomization based approach. And this, without going into it in too much detail, this ended up leading us to select a broad range of different chemistries, um, potencies, and potential toxicity mechanisms from our suite of um, different chemicals. And then we were able to assign multiple exposure scenarios for each one, in many cases, at least. So um, this is, the, in a nutshell, the result of that extended evaluation. Again, a very similar plot to the one I showed you before. Nothing is, the only thing that has changed between the pilot study and this is essentially just um, <clears throat> the, the set of chemicals and exposure scenarios we were considering. Um, so overall, the protectiveness in this case um, was 93%. So in other words, there's only um, th three of the high risk chemical exposure scenarios we're not able to be protective of in this case. So two of those are coming from a warfarin exposure, oral exposure, um, and one of them from a, um, a respiratory sensitization case with trimalytic anhydride. Um, and then we also got a utility value of um, 24%. So in other words, five out of the 21 low risk scenarios we could support under that decision model because they, they're landing in this blue region. Um, as we um, increase, um, across the PBK levels, we were able. It, we found that actually that did lead to a slight increase in protectiveness. So if we try and amalgamate these results together, um, and just simply say, okay, imagine if we did have clinical data, um, and or we just had in vitro data, and we always take the highest PBK level we actually had available to us, so the most accurate model possible, then we let came to a protectiveness value of about ninety eight percent. So. We're not able to be protective in that case against the trimalytic anhydride um, still, but nonetheless, for everything else, we were. Um, but And then the utility here in this case is slightly increased to 33% as well. Um, so we're able to support slightly more of these um, low-risk scenarios using that toolbox. But just before I wrap up, I'd just like to emphasize, of course, again, that even if you've got low risk scenarios falling into this white space, we would call those uncertain risk. And therefore, in many cases, especially for the ones that are close to having a BER value of one, which is this dashed line, uh, you could look to potentially refining those risk assessment decisions further using higher tier tools. Um, so that's um, almost the end of my talk. Um, just to uh, wrap up, uh, we've extended the initial evaluation we did to 38 chemicals and approximately 70 exposure scenarios. The protectiveness metric that we um, came up with varied from 93 to 98%. Uh, so overall, a very pleasing result. Um, and we're continuing to explore this further with the US EPA. Um, one of the main activities there is generating data across more cell lines using high throughput transcriptomics and phenotypic profiling, but just more generally trying to increase and under get to that point of scientific confidence in other areas, tying into um, where we can with the work, for example, with um, Anna van der Zalm in terms of looking at those validation frameworks that are out there and seeing where the available gaps are in terms of that scientific confidence and what else we need to look at. So some of that is around looking at POD reproducibility, for example, understanding the sensitivity and specificity of different points of departure methods, and looking at the sort of diversity of points of departure we get across different cells and, and also how we do the actual cell line selection to, to get to a, a good degree of biological diversity in our assays. Um, just before I finish, of course, I'd like to thank my co-workers for who have um, worked, of course, extremely hard on this project, um, and of, uh, also um, uh, my colleagues at the US EPA who've been instrumental in a lot of this work. Um, and then finally, just thank you for listening. I'll stop there. Thank you, Alistair. That was a great presentation. Um, and I'm sure it has inspired many questions, um, but we will ask that you please hold those questions to the end of the presentation. Um, but you can add them to the Q&A module as they come up and you, and again, just note if um, they're for a specific speaker. Speaking next will be Dr. Tara Barton-McLaren. Uh, 
Dr. Barton McLaren is the research manager of the Emerging Approaches Unit of Health Canada's Existing Substances Risk Assessment Bureau. Uh, she has been contributing to human health risk assessments and methods development under Canada's Chemicals Management Plan since 2007, following the completion of her PhD in Reproductive Toxicology from McGill University. She's a leader in translational research, bridging innovations um, in modern toxicology research and human health risk assessment and serves as the focal point for the development and implementation of new approach methods for chemicals assessment. Dr. Barton McLaren is active at the international level as well, leading and contributing to initiatives aiming to replace, reduce, and refine animal toxicity testing, including efforts under the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, and the Accelerating the Pace of Chemical Risk Assessment, or APGRA. Thank you for being here, Tara, and please go ahead. Hey, thank you very much for that kind introduction and to the organizers for inviting me to speak here today. It's um, really an honor to be part of this epic webinar. Um, and, and certainly thank you to Alistair who did a great job in kind of kicking off um, the session in terms of defining the various acronyms. I know in this area, we get into a bit of an acronym soup and certainly the, the concepts. So I'm gonna cover you know very similar concepts, but coming from a, a bit of a, a slightly different lens, if you will. So I work in the existing substances unit um, at Health Canada. And so we're looking to screen larger inventories of chemicals that are already on the market in Canada um, and incorporate bioactivity workflows and other types of new approach methods into our risk assessment activities. The difference is that we're starting, you know, kind of at the top of the funnel compared to what Alistair uh, presented to you in that we need to use available information um, and only have maybe the opportunities here and there to generate data to address very specific gaps. So the work that we do in introducing these bioactivity workflow comes from a bit of a different angle um, in that we're looking to apply them um, in a screen screening context as to start out with. So just to kind of give a bit of a, an intro and in, in comparison between the talks. So I first want to really start out by acknowledging um, are you the slides moving? There we go. Okay. Um, if they're not moving, please let me know. It was a little slow on my end. Um, so I first want to start by acknowledging all of the fantastic partners and collabor collaborators that we work with and that have significantly contributed to the leadership and success of the various projects that I'm going to highlight today. Um, this includes all the members of my team at Health Canada, as well as our various research and regulatory partners. Um, others in academia, as well as various international organizations, um, and really acknowledge, um, as the introduction indicated, that much of this work also um, leverages work that's ongoing or contributes back to various activities under the OECD um, and APCRA. So as I mentioned, um, and as many recognize, the transition to NAM as a complete replacement over animals is likely continue to be a bit of a challenge and a, and a slow process in the near term. And so where we've started under the Chemicals Management Plan in Canada is to ask questions in terms of where can we begin in the near term to find those opportunities to use currently av available NAM um, with respect to our current prioritization and risk assessment needs and activities. And really asking the question and thinking broadly, how can NAM help us to focus the burden of assessing large inventories of chemicals? So as a starting point, we've really focused early developments on application where the program opportunities provide um, kind of areas or advances where NAM provides information that serves as a step above the current status quo. So we're looking to develop fit for, fit for purpose NAM-based approaches to help us make better informed decisions in the absence of other traditional forms of toxicity test data, 
And this relates to having a number of data poor substances um, that were, require screening and, and possibly future assessment, as well as using this type of information to add mechanistic or mode of action information to inform our assessment activities as well. To support the assessment activities that are ongoing and ensure that we're able to leverage all existing and emerging data and have them continue to be incorporated into the work that we do, we've developed this overarching workflow for data collection, processing, and interpretation. At its foundation, what we're calling the Health Canada Automated Workflow for Prioritization, or HOPPER, um, really is an integrated computational tool that's built using the NIME analytics workflow. Um, and Hopper was built to automate four particular categories of tasks. First, um, chemical data collection and storage, data gap filling and predictive modeling. And here you can see incorporates already a number of uh, new approach methods, including in silico consensus modeling and automated uh, structured-based approaches to support read across. The third task that's automated is evidence evaluation and confidence scoring, which helps to reconcile differences across data types. So for example, there may be higher weighting to a traditional um, OECD test guideline study versus an in silico prediction. And then finally, it provides hazard and exposure-based prioritization scoring. Um, I am only going to focus on the hazard indicators in this presentation, but just to highlight that there's also an equivalent exposure arm um, being developed. And then finally, this provides information reports um, to support further activities, gives data landscapes, opportunity to identify um, data gaps um, and prioritizing chemicals for further work. The NINE platform is modular by design, allowing flexibility to modify as science and information evolves. And this provides a real opportunity to implement novel approaches, both for the collection, but also for the interpretation of both NAM and traditional data streams. Each of these nodes um, in the workflow combines various biological levels into a decision framework. And these really are structured um, in the form of an IATA which includes everything as available from in silico uh, predictions to guideline uh, type studies. This allows us to really use it, the best available data and importantly, to process it efficiently um, and in, in a reproducible way. This helps us to deliver transparent and evidence-based decisions through integrated knowledge. And this is particularly important that we start to integrate the various bioactivity and other NAM type data and workflows. Due to the iterative design of this workflow, um, and obviously the, the speed at which new and emerging information is becoming available, this really helps us um, to incorporate the research and new data that's being generated, and this can feed into the process to address various data gaps. It also provides a strong foundation for further collaborative work to continue to refine and improve the tools, as well as the interpretation of the data uh, for, for use in risk assessment applications as it becomes available. Um, I wanna highlight here that we're developing this workflow, recognizing that NAM may play a role in both protective um, or hazard agnostic approaches as well as working to integrate into more predictive or hazard specific approaches. The start of this journey really did start in terms of the um, application of bioactivity in a more protective manner, um, quite similar to what Alistair had presented. And so I'm gonna start the journey here. This started um, with the Health Canada Science Approach document, which built on the APCRA retrospective case study that was published um, and led by Katie Paul Friedman. And that APCRA case study really looked at a large group of chemicals to evaluate the use of in vitro bioactivity as a lower bound estimate in a protective way um, to the in vivo adverse effect levels. We built on this um, and selected specifically chemicals that had been previously assessed under the chemicals management plan. 
So we developed this bioactivity approach workflow, um, which you've already heard quite a bit about. And in this case, we focused it on the ToxCast endpoints using the fifth percentile AC50 values, using in vitro to in vivo extrapolation. And this was the HTTKR package um, published by the EPA in order to derive bioactivity points of departure. We looked at this workflow um, in a parallel way to what the traditional risk assessment inputs require and to see at the end of the day if comparatively the bioactivity ratio or the BER would put us in a consistent place in terms of the level of concern that we observed in the conclusions in the, based on the margin of exposure from our risk assessments. So we compared the bioactivity PODs to the traditional PODs that were extracted from those uh, 42 risk assessments. We then compared them to Canadian exposure values that were extracted from biomonitoring data, environmental media, and consumer products. And then these BERs, as I mentioned, were evaluated to assess the utility of bioactivity data um, and evaluate the accuracy compared to the risk assessment outcomes in terms of risk assessment. So this is a snapshot and you'll be used to seeing these plots with various uh, data points on them. So this is published in the Bioact Bioactivity Exposure Ratio SIAD or the Science Approach Document. And what we found was that in fact, for 38 of the 41 chemicals previously assessed, the NAM derived AEDs were lower than the traditional points of departure. So indicating that they were protective. So the AEDs um, in the blue triangles and the traditional points of departure, you can see here uh, by the yellow data points. What was also promising uh, based on this first step was that all the non-genotoxic chemicals assessed as SEPA toxic to human health, indicated by the red arrows, fell within um, kind of this BER range that would indicate potential for concern. And this was similar for the ecotoxic chemicals. What this evaluation did highlight um, was, was the potential for outliers. One particular case um, was indicated here by this purple star, quinoline. It was assessed as potentially genotoxic, but identified uh, using this approach as a low priority. So this, as well as a few other exclusions that we identified in this initial analysis, suggested that, in fact, perhaps a parallel approach focused on screening uh, for genotoxicity was needed that builds on these experiences. The science approach document um, underwent public comment period, and based on the early feedback that we received, we've really continued to refine various aspects um, and improve some of the evaluation um, um, elements of this workflow. So specific to these ongoing refinements, um, you know, the, the beauty of the development and this NIME workflow is as they're published, we have the opportunity to integrate. And so we've focused on some of these updates being ensuring that we're using the latest versions of ToxCast database. We've updated the assay um, filtering criteria and more strict criteria so that we can filter out spurious uh, concentration response curves. We've introduced new functionality to filter out activity that occurs above cytotoxicity thresholds. We've updated it again to the latest HTTKR package. And this circle in the middle is what I'm gonna focus on and highlight a little bit more in, in the, the case examples that I'll show you. And this really is um, that we're working to introduce this new ability to move away um, from the nom nominal assay concentration in order to be better able to account for the in vitro distribution using the Armitage mass balance model. And we're looking at this to see how much um, this can improve our AED estimates for these data. When we're doing the HTTK IVIVE, we have typically assumed um, in the high throughput approach that the in vitro benchmark concentration or BMC 
is in fact equivalent to the freely dissolved concentration and the concentration in the serum blood that exerts a toxic effect. When we're applying the IVMBM or the in vitro mass balance modeling, this in fact uses um, assay and chemical specific information to adjust for the in vitro toxicokinetics. And so this calculates the freely dissolved concentration as well as adjustments for the in vitro to in vivo bioavailability, which corrects differences between the exposure medium and the serum. And so this then adjusts the in vitro point of departure that is used in IVIVE to derive the administer equivalent dose. So this becomes your adjusted uh, point of departure. And I just want to acknowledge that much of this work is being done in collaboration with Arnart Research and, and Consulting. The case study that I'm going to first highlight really focuses on the two areas um, that I've just um, discussed in terms of refinements identified as needed uh, from the SIAD results. So we're looking at the need for an approach to improve the predictive screen and evaluation of genotoxicity, as well as to evaluate the impact that the IV MBM has on uh, refining the IV IVE. This case study initially started uh, under APCRA and very really quickly grew uh, into the case study that I'm going to demonstrate under the HESI GTTC committee. So part one of this case study um, looked specifically at 31 compounds. And these 31 reference compounds um, were narrowed down from a list of about 300 possible chemicals. And really, um, this was based on them having at least one source of NAM data so one source of genotoxicity NAM data um, and an in vivo point of departure to compare that to. The chemicals that were included had various mechanisms of action for genotoxicity. And the information that was available from the genotoxicity NAMs was evaluated again using benchmark concentration modeling and extracted to human administered equivalent doses using again, the EPA HTTK um, R package. The results of these 31 compounds um, were then compared to the animal-based PODs to see if in fact this approach, which was refined and specific to the genotoxicity NAMs improved the concordance to the animal-based points of departure. Across the 31 chemicals, there were a number of endpoints that could be compared. So in, in terms of the NAM AEDs, there was 198 um, that were derived from the in vitro genotoxicity, genotoxicity data. And these were compared to 321 PODs from the in vivo data. What we found <clears throat> was that 20 of the 31 chemicals, and this is highlighted in the pink shaded area, had median AEDs that were in fact lower or more protective of the animal-based points of departure. What we did find also in this study though, is that 11 of these chemicals, um, the AEDs from the genotoxicity NAM data were not protective. And so you can see that the in vivo points of departure are in fact lower. In some cases, there's very small differences, but when you look at the bottom um, of this figure here, the, um, the distance between them becomes much larger. And in fact, there's a few of them that had a one order of magnitude higher than the median in vivo POD. Um, the same mes message is really shown here in, in the histograms, which are displayed as the log 10 differences. Um, and I guess the bottom line here that I wanted to share that with this improved and genotoxicity specific approach, we're doing a better job um, and quite a good job at about 60% protective and deeper into this publication that was published by uh, Dr. Mark Beal at Health Canada, this prediction or this protection can be increased when the analysis was based on the mode of action most of the time. But as a next step, we still wanted to see if there are further refinements that can enhance and further improve the accuracy of the IVIVE um, and work to minimize the discrepancies between these AEDs and the PODs 
yet a little bit more. This brings us to part two of the case study, where instead of using that nominal um, in vitro point of departure, which we used in, in point one in the more high throughput way, for the uh, IVIVE, we're then going to examine if these adjusted in vitro PODs using the IVMVM to account for the in vitro disposition um, can in fact improve that AED concordance with the in vivo point of departure. I'm going to take a second on this slide because it's a, a little bit more complex. So this is the first step, um, and this figure illustrates the impact of the um, in vitro mass balance model before undergoing the IVIVE. So we start with the nominal um, concentration. You then apply the scaling factor to account for the in vitro bioavailability, and finally, account for the bioavailability differences between in vitro and in vivo, ending up with this IV POD or the in vitro POD. Looking over here um, at the figure, sorry, I'm on the wrong screen. Um, when the IV MBM scaling factor is applied, the calculated BMCs, which are shown in blue, can be substantially lower than the nominal values illustrated in green. Um, for the bioavailability in plasma, this is shown in the pink. So the bioavailability in the plasma can be greatly reduced in comparison with the serum-free or low serum exposure medium conditions. And what you see here is that for compounds with the higher log KOW, the bioavailability in plasma was lower than the bioavailability in vitro. And this can result in a net increase in the in vitro BMC in comparison to the calculations that, that do not consider the in vitro disposition. And so you can see in the, the pink color here that this was a case for a number of the chemicals. Um, and, and really, um, again, the take home messages that this impacts those with a larger KOW more than others. So now the next step is to bring this um, in vitro POD forward um, apply the IVIVE to derive the AEDs, which then can be compared to the nominal AODs from the first part of this case study. What we see here are the results after, as I mentioned, applying the HTTKR package. And here, the point of this step in the, in the study was really just to look for improvements in the AED after applying the adjustments. Um, when we're looking at the AD in the nominal, um, in this case, the nominal is the pink. Um, you can see that compared to the um, AED after the adjustments, all of the compounds where the AED originally was lower um, still is lower than the in vivo points of departure, and the vice versa is true. But what I really want to highlight here and the key finding is that we managed to close the gap for 11 of the compounds um, analyzed. And you can see in this case where the purple diamond becomes closer or better aligned with the in vivo point of departure, which is in the green star. Now, again, at the bottom, we still see these exceptions. And so this highlights that throughout each process and throughout each refinement, there's a need to further establish the means of applicability um, look to see if we can establish exclusion criteria and develop some guidance around these findings so that we can extend these evaluations to a broader chemical space, um, which is really the, the goal for the domestic substance list. Without this, it'll be difficult to do that high throughput screening and really identify those chemicals where the further refinements will have the greatest impact. I'm going to shift now to work that's ongoing to advance the use of transcriptomics for chemical assessment. And the main focus here has been on developing approaches or workflows that help us to interpret the large and complex data sets that are being generated using omics technologies. To move to more routine use, there really is a need to establish um, acceptable practices and work certainly towards best practices on the methodology used to establish the points of departure, 
And so we've been working a lot to address the question around um, these acceptable practices and really how do we define what could be considered as an optimal or um, various different approaches to derive the point of departure. A recent study that we published that uh, strives to get at this answer, if you will, was a meta-analysis of existing data sets um, where we compiled various published um, studies which resulted in data for a total of about 179 concentration response experiments spanning 117 chemicals. As you can see here, these various experiments covered a number of different models as well as um, exposure conditions, um, but we did limit to the available information that used the TempoSeq data for kind of one baseline element. This is the workflow on the left-hand side, or the overview of the workflow that was used to derive the in vitro points of departure for comparison with the apical PODs from curated databases um, listed in step four. In terms of the processing, back to step one, we did use the original pre-processed data that were produced from independent bioinformatic pipelines. Um, and then what I'm gonna focus on more uh, for this example is really the step two or the derivation where the t pods were derived again from the in vitro concentration response data using BMC modeling. Um, and this mathematical model helps us to identify the defined response above background. Um, and then these BMCs were used to derive transcriptomic points of departure using various approaches. And in fact, in this um, meta-analysis, we looked at seven different approaches to evaluate or to calculate the T pods falling under two, two separate tracks. A little bit more detail or, or more specifically regarding the tracks that we use in this case. So looking at these gene accumulation curves, each chemical is depicted as a distribution of genes with benchmark concentration to derive these T pods. And we're using the T pods to define the point of concerted molecular change as indicated um, here in this left-hand figure. Then taking those various BMCs or T pods, you can derive um, the actual effect level or those points of departure based on two different approaches. The first, we looked at various uh, distributions to derive the T pods and the example on the right shows um, how th the selection can differ between perhaps the 20th lowest BMD value, the 10th percent of the gene BMD values, or it could be the mode of the first peak. Um, we didn't use exactly those, but we did use um, approaches that are similar in the fifth percentile, first mode, or 25th rank gene. And then we also use gene sets to derive these T pods. Um, and this used the median gene BMC value of the lowest or the most sensitive gene set from a selection of uh, various open source curated uh, pathway databases as listed here, KEG, GO, and Reactome. So taking um, the 117 chemicals and deriving these T pods from the various approaches, we were able to um, do a general comparison across all of these approaches to see if there were any that were emerging as being you know, more robust than others uh, in a consistent way. Here, this figure shows all of these T pods compiled into one large figure. I know, again, it's very busy, but really just to um, hit home the message that really there was overall good agreement between the data points suggesting that across these various data sets, um, there was really robust transcriptomics data. Um, these are each subgrouped, each of these panels are subgrouped by each data set that was evaluated and ranked by their chemical potency uh, based on the T pods. The blue represents the BMC distribution and the pink, those T pods generated using the gene center, the pathway approach. Um, the one thing that did jump out is panel A. So 
this represents BPA and alternatives. And out of all of the data sets that we evaluated, these came out as being some of the more potent T pods, but there seemed to be less agreement between the, the approaches. So some additional um, evaluation and look into this data set. In terms of the, <clears throat> the other data set, they were all quite well aligned. And one observation that continues to come out in the evaluation is that some of the commonly used approaches may not be the most reliable. And so, as I mentioned in the science approach document, we did start with it using the fifth percentile, um, but this seems to be emerging as maybe an overly conservative approach in, in many cases, as we start to expand the evaluation across different types of bioactivity and different um, types of chemistries and, and data sets. So the final finding in terms of this general comparison is that we are finding that the 25th rank gene and the gene set uh, lowest and most sensitive gene set analysis seems to continually emerge as sound alternatives to some of the other commonly used uh, approaches to define that transcriptomics point of departure. We then wanted to extrapolate these PODs again into uh, administered equivalent doses using, again, the HTTKR package and compare these to the apical PODs. This figure illustrates just that. So we carried forward the lowest and the most conservative estimate from our T-pods and plot them along the apical PODs from the in vivo studies um, shown here as a log 10 ratio. What we found is that our NAM-based values, again, are lower or more protective than those estimates from the reproductive developmental or chronic dose animal studies that we extracted as comparables. And this was true regardless of whether we were using the BMC distribution approaches as shown in panel A or the gene set approaches as shown in panel B. Again, um, we're always interested in these learnings. And so we see that these chemicals highlighted in red were exceptions to that rule of protection, where um, in this case, we actually had traditional points of departure that were lower than the NAM-based PODs. And so looking further into some of these chemicals provides insights on the types of physical properties or the types of um, chemistries that require further refinements or uh, additional approaches to be incorporated into our workflows. So in these cases, some require metabolic activation, which is true of cyclophosphamide. Um, some of these chemicals may have multiple routes of exposure and toxicity, or the in vitro cell liner model used just didn't capture the type of um, toxicity that is elicited by some of these chemicals, such as for the herbicides, for example. So the meta-analysis was really important to, to suggest that maybe we're not at the point where we can suggest or recommend a single best or universal, universal T-pod, and that perhaps a range of approaches across the diverse in vitro data sets may need to be considered as we move forward. We wanted to explore how we could integrate this thinking um, and use all of the bioactivity information that's provided across the various types of um, cell lines and approaches and integrate these to support, better support screening and assessment decisions. To do this, we're looking at integrated approaches to testing and assessment. And this represents a flexible framework it allows us to include a range of different methods and sources of information, as you've seen, are continually being generated and, and become available. We can assemble these in different ways. And in this way, we can develop these fit for purpose applications so that we can use the various lines of evidence um, in different regulatory decision-making contexts, really depending on the assessment questions and the protection goals. In this case, the lines of evidence can be integrated for situations such as to support grouping and read across, um, or they can be all um, integrated to support overall weight of evidence for assessment. So in the next example, I want to highlight how we're working to integrate different types of approaches and bioactivity points of departure, both from 
the protective workflows and from the workflows that are being developed um, in a more predictive way using endocrine disruption activity um, as an example. And this example works to incorporate both the bioactivity and biomarker signatures, um, looking at endocrine mode of action for bisphenols. The development of the IATA approach using a subset of bisphenols really began with the publication of the OECD IATA case study last December. This case study was followed by some further examination of the data set as published um, in TOXSCI and a study led by Ella Atlas at Health Canada and Carol Yock at Ottawa U. And these two first publications really worked to explore how high throughput transcriptomics could be used to establish mechanistic similarities um, in data poor BPA alternative chemicals, as well as to compare potence, potencies and continue to increase our understanding of how these lines of evidence can be used to support prioritization and assessment of um, other data poor chemicals. We've continued to build on these works to pilot a workflow that aims to more generally guide the use of the NAM data in different assessment contexts. And this is the workflow um, in a paper in preparation that we're working on, which provides the overview of this tier-based assessment workflow that was used to evaluate the different lines of evidence and the different streams of data and to ultimately determine the estimates that can be used in um, for the risk assessment activities. In the interest of time, I'm not going to walk through each of these steps, but really just highlight that the goal of this uh, tiered and integrated workflow is to illustrate how the various pieces of information from in silico, ToxCast, um, and the in vitro high throughput, high throughput transcriptomics can be used in more of um, a predictive toxicity manner specific to estrogen activity, how they can be used then to estimate a point of departure. And in the cases where you would have data poor chemicals where um, through this more predictive um, workflow mechanism, you weren't able to identify points of departure to derive the applied equivalent doses, introducing the non-specific toxicity stream still has value um, in that you're able to include potency comparison across all chemicals in a group um, even if a specific mode of action is not well understood or identified. So bringing this forward and finally illustrating how really can we put all of these pieces of information or all of these lines of evidence together, we've illustrated at the end in terms of this BER estimation, how nonspecific toxicity pathway information as well as ER specific information can be integrated and compared in this overall analysis to, to support the examination and evaluation of a group of uh, both structurally similar um, and functional alternatives. What we're seeing here again is that the in vitro bioactivity data demonstrated to be quite robust, and we're seeing quite strong agreement across the two different approaches in, in this case and for this subset of chemicals, where the AEDs for the nonspecific toxicity highlighted in the yellow color, produced in many cases very similar values to the ER specific estimates when those values um, were available. And again, kind of that same story resonating across the two presentations is the bioactivity based AEDs were typically lower than the apical PODs from the, from the animal data. Again, we're highlighting here where some of those typical approaches that you've often seen um, such as the lowest pathway, are showing to be overly perhaps conservative com compared to these um, different approaches that we've evaluated, specifically the 25th uh, rank gene and or the biomarker and uh, ER area under the curve approach from the TOXCAST data. So as a final conclusion, um, in terms of the integrated approach, the use of the various lines of information um, and the bioactivity estimates can really provide practical information both to inform potency and mode of action for hazard and, and risk characterization.
Learnings and insights. I think it, it's clear that using these automated workflows allows us to use new information and increasingly complex information um, to maintain the uh, flexibility to update and ensure that we're using the best available science in an ongoing way um, in a transparent, reproducible and efficient way. Um, there was interesting insights in terms of the application of the IVMBM, um, where we did see greater impact um, for the higher log KOW. Um, but on the con side, and, and this really underscores the need to develop this guidance and, and maybe further annotation to identify those chemicals for which these refinements are, are needed, is that it does require specific information that's often difficult to find or not available um, for the data poor chemicals, and it also reduces throughput if that's a goal of your approach. There are many technical and practical challenges remaining um, and just wanna highlight, you know, similar to what Alistair had mentioned, this need for characterizing uncertainty. I didn't mention in here, but this also applies to the methods that I've um, highlighted here. And then the question still stands, if there is a need um, to have predictive approaches for each of the toxicity endpoints of regulatory interest, um, I think we're really still touching the tip of the iceberg here. We've demonstrated a lot of valuable um, and useful approaches to using bioactivity in a protective way, but to get to the predictive approaches using NAM across the various toxicity endpoints, there's much work to be done. Finally, to wrap this up, I want to reiterate the importance of the re research and regulatory collaborations. These are truly imperative and really have been um, the success to where we are at Health Canada to date. Um, and wanted to encourage everybody in this field to continue to build a common vision um, and maintain that commitment to advance alternative methods to maintain excellence in science-based decision-making. So with that, I thank you very much um, for attending the session. And uh, yeah, if there's any questions, I guess we're at that, that point in the session. So thanks, Christy. I see you've popped up. <laughs> I will try to stop sharing. No worries. We are indeed at the Q&A portion of our um, Okay, I've stopped our sharing. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, Alistair, I don't know if you want to, uh, there you are. So just to, to orient everyone briefly, we have a Q and A module, which you can reach at the bottom of your screen. Please put your questions in there. We have a few minutes to address them. Um, and also I wanted to tell you that there are some, uh, a couple of answered questions already uh, by Alistair. So if you um, check that out. Um, you can see the responses. So the first one is maybe just a really quick one um, for you, Tara. It's uh, is the Hopper tool publicly available, or is that an internal Health Canada tool? So this is currently a tool that is internal. Um, we are drafting this into a science approach document which we hope to publish, I was gonna say kind of early 2024, if that's fair. I think we're aiming for probably end of winter, early spring. And so that will provide the first opportunity for anybody to take a look um, at the science approach document that really describes Hopper, its contents, um, some of the decision workflows, et cetera. So we hope that, you know, eventually it will be something that's uh, more publicly available and that will be the first opportunity for everybody to, to take a look at that. Great, thank you. So we have a couple of questions about in vitro um, uh, concentration. So sort of nominal or actual concentrations. And one of them is around, um, you know, the concern of, of binding to some of the plastic and some of the materials. And then another one was specific to your presentation, Tara, was asking about the Armitage program and is, is, is that the only one available or are there other kinds of um, programs that you can use 
to help with that uh, understanding. So maybe we'll go to Alistair first, maybe if you want to share a couple of thoughts about um, this topic and, and within your approach. I mean, yeah, it's definitely very important. Um, we do do uh, initial assessment on whether or not th things like plastic binding or volatility would be uh, significant. Um, and so I think for the chemicals that we were looking at, we, we found that wasn't necessarily the case. Um, we, in the work I was talking about, we do take nominal concentrations, but what we've also been doing in parallel is generating a large set of data across the same chemicals, um, comparing the um, <clears throat> the sort of predictions you get from the Armitage like models to what you can actually measure in terms of free concentrations. Um, and that's going to be forming the base of a, a separate publication where we also look at uh, uh, decision flow um, and when you need to uh, maybe conduct uh, further experiments to um, yeah, get a better understanding of what the free concentration is depending on the underlying chemistry. Um, so yeah, definitely very important and something that we'd probably be looking to integrate into our overall decision framework and toolbox further in the future, I think. Great. Yeah. Okay. Tara, did you want to add? And then really just to build on that in terms of the question, you know, is the Armitage model the only one available? I think really this is where we have started. And as I mentioned, looking to gain experience across broad chemical space and to see if we can develop a framework that allows us to determine the different tiers of refinements that would be needed. And so as part of evaluating this model and then looking to you know, where it works well or not so well, that will also lead us to explore different opportunities and, and different methods to incorporate into to the workflow. So I think we're kind of at the, the first steps in exploring these refinements and, and our ability to incorporate them into this more automated workflow. And in doing that, um, I think you know some of the important lessons or insights is finding out where these models clearly don't work well and why they don't. And so we can better identify those chemicals to to do a little bit of a deeper dive, if you will, to see if there are uh, other methods that need further work so that we can you know, start to incorporate uh, different tools in the toolbox, I guess, going to, the, to Alistair's um, terminology and when and how do we apply these in, in, a, in the best informed way that we can. Great, great. So we uh, have a question about essentially how close are any of the presented methodologies as alternatives to animal testing being adopted by governmental regulatory agencies? Now, Tara, of course, you're, you've are you talked a little bit about how you're using these approaches. Um, I don't know if you wanna speak to whether you consider them alternatives to animals or, or if you're thinking about integrating them you know more broadly into decision making and then and then we can go to Alistair. Um, yeah, I think in, in terms of you know exact timing, it's very difficult to say because there is a certain level of readiness um, that corresponds with the context of use. And so in terms of readiness and some of the prioritization workflows that I've illustrated to you, we are using them. We are using them in the context of prioritization. Certainly we're looking at the bioactivity and the BERs to help us prioritize chemicals that would have otherwise not been prioritized perhaps because of a lack of traditional data. So in these contexts, we're currently using them. Um, in terms of using them in formal risk assessment and decision-making, we have used NAMs for quite some time in this aspect, read across, for example. Um, and we continue to integrate this new information um, with traditional sources to support the risk assessments. We're not using them as standalone or, or replacements at this time in many cases. Skin sensitization, uh, the defined approach may be an exception to that in our new substances program where we are seeing submissions. Um, but it's going to be a, an iterative and progressive um, approach, I guess, to integrating as the um, as the approach becomes available um, within the risk assessments. And, and again, kind of hitting on the data availability um, in our program, it's 
in existing substances, it's often difficult to integrate if the data is not available for the chemicals of interest. So that that's a lens, you know, there's kind of two prongs. Is the method ready and is the data available? Yeah. And Alistair, you want to? Yeah, no, I mean, the only thing I would say is, I guess there are a number of examples in in this field where, you know, NAMs have been shown to be sufficiently predictive of specific endpoints and therefore have been accepted from a regulatory point of view um, for use in uh, sort of toxicity assessments. I guess the challenge that we have in this space is that we're moving more to a protective uh, viewpoint and how we use them. Um, without necessarily being predictive and, and and the key point is really integrating the exposure and the hazard information to make the safety assessment um, and so from a regulatory point of view um, moving to a space where the, the tools can be evaluated and, and validated within the context of exposure I think from what we're trying to do is a, is a key challenge um, so that's all I have to say on that <laughs> Um, I want to, we have a question for both of you, but I want to put it to, to Alistair first. Um, it's about cell line selection and are they, it, you presented a lot of information. So maybe the cases, it's kind of, kind of a case by case basis, but they're wondering if the cell lines are selected specific for chemical modes of action or, or are there some other. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, so for the, well, particularly, I guess this is around for the uh, transcriptomics analysis that we do. Um, yeah, so for those, we we did select um, what we thought were three reasonable cell lines initially um, to just try and cover off a, break, a broad range of potential bioactivity. But what we've been doing more in a sort of more systematic way um, with Josh Harrell at the US EPA is coming up with, um, well, it's really Josh's work. Um, it's looking at uh, the diversity of baseline expression across a broad range of different um, cell models, and then basically having a process for selecting those cell models based on biological diversity of the baseline expression. So that allowing you to um, then try and cover off a broad degree of biological space with really as few cells as possible. Um, and so that's just at the end, my final slide, I just show a brief snapshot of some of that data that we're generating, uh, where we then selected those cells and then treated them with the different chemicals to see what we get out. Um, I mean, it does turn out that actually the three cells that we'd selected were among actually some of the most diverse that he had actually pulled out in his analysis, but that was after the fact, actually. But yeah, I think um, generally speaking, I mean, again, going forward, we want to be able to, of course, select um, a good range of biological diversity. And I think, for example, Joss's work on in terms of having a process for doing that would be really important in that space. Yeah. And Tara, did you want to add anything? No, not a lot to add. Really, we're working with the EPA and, and the folks that Alistair mentioned as well. And there's a, a case study under APCRA um, looking prospectively um, and, it, and again, looking at some of the, the questions uh, around the selection of, of cell lines um, and how they can be improved to be more predictive of uh, certain endpoints of toxicity. So just to say, we're kind of working with the, the same folks on addressing that question. Um, I just see a question here that I did want to answer quickly in terms of, you know, endpoints that are not included in the predictive section. Um, this is kind of Hopper uh, 1.0 as we have it. And so that's the beauty of this workflow is that we will continue to um, expand and incorporate other types of toxicity. Um, just in this version, we limited to those that are most commonly used and where the data most frequently exists in the context of the chemicals that uh, we evaluate. But certainly we're looking to expand and continue to incorporate all types of information in, in more nodes, in iterative versions um, of the tool. Thank you. So I'm so sorry we are out of time for questions. Um, Thank you to everyone who added your added your questions to all of you who listened today. And in particular, thank you to um, Tara and Alistair for your presentations.
Uh, thank you also to our co-hosts, EPA and California EPA um, and the PETA Science Consortium. We uh, will be posting the um, recording and the slides uh, for the webinar on the PETA Science Consortium International website uh, very shortly in the next couple of days. And please look forward to our next EPIC webinar, which is going to be in February. Thanks again to both of you and thanks for joining us and, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much for listening. Everyone. Yeah. Nice to see you. Nice to see you all. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.